Hi, hi, and welcome everybody. Um, just a quick heads up or a technical reminder, we are live streaming this session. So if you um, don't want to be recognized, you can switch off your camera and change your on-screen name. Um, yeah, and then I would like to, um, to wish you a warm welcome to our third workshop of the day um, on um, the last normal forum day. Tomorrow we will have a, a very big day with lots of sessions uh, and then we have a closing session on, on Wednesday, Tuesday for the Americans. Um, but tonight we're very, uh, we're very happy to have this uh, very interesting panel on global democracy and how can we accelerate its implementation. Um, and with us is uh, Lucy from Gloco, who will be moderating. Um, but before I give the word to you, Lucy, I just want to um, remind everybody or tell people who hadn't joined before how you can join this session, how you can par participate. Um, so the idea is that it is a participatory session that you can ask questions, you can comment. Um, so um, we will start with, uh, with, a, with a panel, uh, but then afterwards, uh, the floor is also open to, to you, the participants. Um, and there are basically two ways um, to do that. You can write um, your questions or comments in the chat, or you can raise your hand. Zoom even has an electronic function for that. It should be in the participants window on the bottom left. There's this little blue hand that you can use to, um, to signal that you want to say something and then we will give you the floor. Um, we also do have a little bit uh, some rules. Um, so if you are using the chat, please only use it for things that are relevant to the session um, and be nice and be respectful and then everything uh, should go fine. And so then now I would like to hand over the word to you, Lucy. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Caroline, for the nice introduction. Thank you for organizing this amazing forum. We're very excited to be part of it. Um, so allow me to say a, um, a few words before I hand over to our panelists, um, because we're here to um, discuss an increasingly urgent dimension um, of democracy, which is the global level. Um, what we want to do is actually to think about specific ways in which we can accelerate it. Um, so we're not just here to talk about democracy or global democracy in general, but to think about very specific um, implementation plans. For it's absolutely clear that we live in a thoroughly globalized, um, connected and complex world. Um, whether it is information flows or economic flows or um, uh, political um, interactions, or capital flows, it really is impossible to separate the local from the global. And this is particularly pertinent when it comes to some of the most pressing problems of today, be it climate change, which you addressed in the previous channel, for instance, be it tax evasion, be it biodiversity loss, um, the causes as well as the solutions lie on a global level. However, I think we can all agree that um, established political structures are to a large degree stuck in technologies and in um, models of the 19th and 20th century. So this leads not only to a disengagement and to a disenchantment um, of citizens across the world, which we can witness in many different countries um, across the globe, um, it also, and most importantly, prevents developing effective solutions to these global problems. And these solutions need to be on a global level, not on a national or on a regional level. So the question is, um, how can we achieve a democratic system on a global level which allows for the more or less direct participation of citizens around the world to design these global solutions and to make sure that they are implemented effectively. Now, there are many ideas and initiatives, indeed also technologies out there, tackling this admittedly highly ambitious um, goal. Um, and we're very excited um, to have um, here on this panel, um, three representatives of three initiatives uh, with whom me, my name is Lucy, 
As you heard, I'm a founding member of GLOCA, of one of these um, initiatives. Uh, we hope to be developing more um, specific ways forward uh, in the very near future. And this panel is actually um, a sort of a kickoff kick meeting as well. So what we want to do in the next 90 minutes um, is firstly um, give each other, but mainly also our audience, um, a better understanding of what these three initiatives um, are about, how they work, what their sort of key strengths are, key features. Um, and secondly, as mentioned uh, in the beginning, this is all about identifying very specific areas of collaboration and cooperation as well. So we want to walk out of this panel in, with a sort of sketch of, a, of an action plan. Um, uh, that would be extremely exciting. So I'm super excited um, that you are all here. Uh, all of you in varying degrees having built up or are building up um, uh, initiatives to set up a global democracy. Um, please allow me to start with somebody who can't join us today. That is um, Alexandra Gaviano. She is a representative of um, Extinction Rebellion and Greenpeace. She is very disappointed she can't join us, but actually she is in the thick of a whole week of action against climate change, which is taking place here in Switzerland, in Bern, in the capital city, uh, in front of the government building, huge political uh, waves <laughs> that it's caused. Um, there's a climate activist protest. There was a camp and assembly, which was cleared by the police. Um, there was a massive big demonstration and protest today, and this evening they're gathering for an exchange on the scientific um, evidence supporting climate change. So unfortunately, she's at the heart of it and can't join us, which is a great shame because I think she would have brought in a different perspective, which is one of activism, of bottom-up um, uh, engagement and mobilization around very specific topic. Um, but on the other hand, it will give us more time to, to lay out um, the key features of the initiatives which uh, you represent. Um, and so thank you very much, Asaf Eshet of the Global Online Democracy um, to have joined us. Global Online Democracy has uh, an interesting acronym, GOD, which uh, is very promising, I think. <laughs> So thank you very much for joining us. We have Santiago Siri, who um, is joining us representing Democracy Earth. And last but not least, my fellow combatant and colleague, uh, Gary Colombo, who is um, the head of GLOCO, which stands for Global Community. Now, I won't say very much about the individual um, initiatives because uh, I am hoping that our panelists will do that. Um, and I would like to um, invite them to introduce their initiatives. And I would like you to be quite specific. I would like you to um, share with us the key features of your initiatives. You know, what are the sort of unique selling propositions? How do you want to achieve global um, democracy, what are the mechanisms that your initiative are employing, um, and maybe very briefly also share one or two experiences with it. So I'd just like to give you a couple of minutes each to introduce yourselves, as well as your initiative, um, just as a first round, um, to serve as an overview of what kind of initiatives are actually out there, and also to identify, you know, complementarities um, and, and synergies uh, which will then take us into the next round of question. So thank you again for joining us. And um, if I may, Asaf, if I may start with you, if you would like to introduce yourself briefly um, and then give us the nuts and bolts of uh, the global online democracy. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to present the Global Online Democracy Organization on this forum. Um, so I just jump in uh, and I would like to say um, as a start that uh, it might be very obvious what I'm going to say, 
but I think it's still very important. And um, when we talk about global democracy, like if we build it wrong and it falls into the wrong hands, it can bring much more damage than good uh, to, the to the citizens of the world. Uh, we must all uh, know um, exactly like, um, we must not build global democracy upon the structure of representative democracy, is what I mean. So we all know why, um, and we see why representative democracy doesn't serve us. Uh, so instead it should be global direct democracy with politicians that hold no decision-making power. The decision-making power must be in the hands of the general population. Um, and the change must come from the people, uh, from the grassroots. Um, so we are trying to achieve global democracy uh, in the Global Online Democracy Organization with the following approaches. Uh, first, the Global Online Democracy Organization is responsible uh, for a platform where every person in the world can vote in different geographical levels, neighborhood, city, municipality, nation level and global. Uh, however, um, we will not be voting together to choose a politician to the government, but we will be voting on how to solve a problem. Because why do we need parties? Why do we need uh, left and right Repu Republicans and Democrats? Why do we need to fight with one another? Uh, every one of us has its own opinion and can vote for it on the platform. Uh, the idea is to bring people back into the democratic process and involve them in shaping our future and thereby slow, uh, slowly eliminate representative democracy. You can look at it as an online referendum 24 seven for all geographical levels I just mentioned. So our approach is focused on, on technological disruption of the political system. We are advancing our organization much, much like a startup. Uh, we use technological, technological elements like AI, blockchain, technology, liquid democracy, and participatory budgeting to increase voting participation. Um, the same way all the big online giants like Amazon, Facebook, Google, Uber, etc disrupt their industries and have creating, created something new and better functioning. This is what we need, a better functioning democracy. Uh, the next approach is communication. So we need to communicate to everyone that there is a solution. People around the world are tired. They don't believe in democracy anymore. They don't vote. Uh, if they try to protest, they are being pushed down by their governments. And generally, they don't believe in the political system or the political process anymore. So the message needs to be loud and clear, doable and practical, that it's not the future, it's now. And we must be clear that it's not democracy that has failed us all, it's representative democracy, and it's a completely different system which we can change. Um, the next approach is donations. So only an organization based on donations can be free of interest. We all need to take the responsibility for the change, which means that each, each and every one of us must donate, starting from today, to one of the organization advancing direct democracy. Also, it's important to realize that decision-making is in the heart of all the problems we face globally and locally. If we fix decision-making system, our problems will be solved naturally. At the same time, we need to be practical. We need to open direct democracy parties in all the countries and insert our own representatives to the government, but without them having any decision-making power. They will not be able to vote upon policies or legislation without first bringing the issue to the public and see how people want to solve it. 
We now, in the global online democracy, started the process of collecting signatures from people around the world to support our organization. And this is basically it. Um, there are much more aspects of the global online democracy organization, uh, which all of you can find in the global online democracy.org. And this is it. Hope it was clear. That, <laughs> thank you very much, Asa. I to push a lot in very short time. So. No, no, of course. And we will hopefully have, um, we will definitely have the opportunity to, to develop that. I think you've set the stage in um, an excellent well. And I think looking at these new forms of decision-making power are really important. Um, but moving on swiftly, I would like to hand over the virtual floor to um, Santiago um, uh, and you could maybe share the experiences that you've had with Democracy Earth and tell us also a little bit more about what, how exactly you are going about uh, global democracy. Hello, my, my name is Santiago Siri. Um, I'm from Argentina, now based in Madrid. My experience with this uh, dates back eight years ago when I started a political party back in Argentina called Partido de la Red, or the, the Internet Party, that had candidates uh, that were committed to always vote in Congress according to people's will online. Every single bill would be voted uh, by, by the people over the Internet and uh, the congressman from our party, if he or she was elected, he would always vote according to what people tell him to vote on the internet. Um, we ran for one election in 2013. Uh, we got 22,000 votes, which is around 1%. We needed 3% to get the candidate elected. But that whole thing kickstarted for us, the understanding how the world of traditional politics plays and what, what does it mean to try to change the system from within if the, the system doesn't end up changing you first, which is, in my opinion, extremely likely if you end up playing that kind of game. Um, and also learned about the technological difficulties of actually deploying democracies over the internet. Our original approach was to do an open source software where people would uh, put proposals, debate and vote them. It was a relatively successful open source project. Uh, it got translated to 20 languages and it was implemented by parliaments, nonprofit organizations, our own political party and other political parties. And in 2015, I, uh, we got an offer to go to Silicon Valley uh, from Y Combinator, which is a very successful uh, startup accelerator there. And we figured we would go to Silicon Valley to start building the right technology stack that would allow us to build stuff that uh, helps deploy democracies over the internet. Um, in, in, that's when we started the, the Democracy Earth Foundation. And in these past five years, since 2015, we have implemented all kinds of democratic pilots uh, in context of real conflict. We have implemented pilots with political parties, with uh, government parliaments, with nonprofit organizations and with political movements. Uh, we have worked with the umbrella movement in Hong Kong. We have done a shadow referendum in Colombia for the peace agreement. We have uh, implemented the first version of quadratic voting in the state of Colorado in the US. And in these past five years, we have pretty much tried every model of democracy you can think of, participatory budgeting, liquid democracy, direct democracy, uh, quadratic voting, and so on. We have tried uh, every variant of the technology stack, uh, originally starting with open source software, but it became very clear that just doing open source means nothing. Uh, we eventually became interested in decentralization uh, because we have seen attacks to our software by database administrators that have a bias in the outcome of an election. So how you build a system that does not rely on a choke point like a database. So we started building technology on top of blockchain stuff. We have worked initially with Bitcoin to see what was possible to do with it, since it had a lot of economic activity back then. 
And more recently, we are pretty much embedded in the conversation around governance that's happening within Ethereum. Um, in these past five years, every single pilot we have done in a relevant context has been attacked in one way or another, or has been exploited in one way or another. Democracy is something that happens uh, when decisions are difficult, when the stakes are high. So the need for democracy uh, uh, craves for the need for legitimacy in the process of decision making. The higher the risk of a decision, the higher the need for legitimacy. That's why we do democracy. Now, um, you usually go to democratic to the democratic route for difficult choices, not for easy choices. And difficult choices means that there will be very hostile actors uh, in the process trying to corrupt the system one way or another. And whenever we did a, a digital election uh, in a hostile environment, like in Hong Kong, we have done an election for 800,000 citizens. And we were basically hijacked by Chinese bots in our system. Um, so we are very aware of the limits that technology have right now. Uh, but that said, if, if I were to put some special attention, the, the one community around the world today that is legitimately innovating in the surface of what's possible with governance and governance technology is the community building smart contracts, which is a, which is a new generation of software. Uh, fundamentally, it's software that runs on Ethereum. There are other blockchains around there, but Ethereum is the only relevant one in terms of transactions and and economic activity. And right now, uh, there's a category of smart contracts known as DAOs, distributed autonomous organizations, which is basically corporations on, on a blockchain. And within DAOs, there's a lot of innovation happening on how governance can work. There are, for example, innovations around continuous voting. Uh, people are lazy, people don't like to vote. So a system where you, you, you put some tokens in an issue and the longer those tokens remain in that issue, the stronger your vote gets. Um, the idea of quadratic voting is a very interesting uh, novel game theoretic innovation that allows not only measuring the preference of a voter, but also the intensity of those preferences. Uh, and these democratic possibilities are uh, are breakthroughs that are made possible by the rise of this new generation of software. So I would encourage to pay a lot of attention to networks like Ethereum, uh, where, where there's legitimate innovation around governance, and there are very powerful, in some cases, extremely uh, uh, rich networks with significant amount of capital uh, that are trying to implement these innovations in governance. Uh, and this means that you know what, what's happening on these systems are not servants. What happens in these systems triggers real allocation of capital. So uh, I, I, that's the ecosystem that I'm pretty much embedded, you know, since probably the last two or three years. Uh, yet uh, there's a one very big missing component. Uh, most of the governance on, on these networks today is pretty much plutocratic. Uh, it's based, you vote with your money, uh, like shareholder voting in corporations. Uh, there's still no way of formalizing human identity in these types of networks. We have been able to formalize human identity on the web. And that's called Facebook and that's called Google and the big tech companies. But the problem of Facebook and Google, fundamentally Facebook uh, very notoriously broke democracy as we knew it. Uh, because it's been able to track our activity on a daily basis and through that uh, manipulate and exploit the communication of campaigns, not only in the United States, which has been a thing since Barack Obama, not since Donald Trump, and uh, around the world. So the threat of the internet to traditional democracies is pretty real, uh, and very consistent to the, the trauma democracy faces around the world today. So the challenge is how we are able to formalize human identity in a way that it's completely privacy preserving. Uh, so this is a very hard problem. Uh, identity is the one vulnerability being exploited across every kind of system. And uh, the, the challenge here is to differentiate between verifying a person and verifying the right to use a technology. This is a very important distinction. 
uh, a democratic system only needs to know that you haven't voted twice. It doesn't need to know who you are. The second a system knows who you are, surveillance kicks in. So we need to rethink identity, look it under a whole new lens, and uh, ideally start building systems of distributed systems that can formalize human identity. There's a paper I co-authored. Uh, if you look into my Twitter profile, uh, and I can share the link on, on the chat here, uh, that explores seven protocols that are trying to do this. It's called proof of personhood. Um, and these are protocols that are trying to formalize human identity without uh, requiring revealing any kind of personal information from the users. And if these components or these protocols become successful, then there's hope. Otherwise, I'm a pessimist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santiago. Um... That is, in some ways, quite a sobering assessment, I think, of the ecosystem in which we are, um, or in the context that we are moving in. So you can be very idealistic about global democracy, other can be, others can be very cynical. You are extremely specific about um, the challenges that we are facing. One, you know, the hostility um, and, and hostile interests uh, that are very real. Um, and the others um, relate to um, the technological challenges, it's specifically around um, identity issues. Um, but I think those are exciting points too. I mean, it is also clear where we need to be moving forward, obviously not naively, um, but you also identified some software um, breakthroughs, which I think are very promising um, in making a global democracy and participation on a global level um, uh, very uh, feasible. And on this note, I'd like to um, ask Gary Colombo to introduce GLOCO, which is very much focused on individual um, votes and participation on a global system. Please, Gary, the floor is yours. Yes, hello everybody. Also from my side, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present uh, GLOCO, the global community here. And very similar to what we heard from Asaf and Santi, we also have the same goal, which is to um, work on a global direct democracy system. What are, what are the main points? I mean, the main point we already heard from Lucy in the introduction, there are big global problems that can only be solved if we have a global approach. And uh, that is, of course, the goal number one. I, I think that's the one we all share, where we all work in the same direction. Uh, the second point is that one global citizen should also have one vote. I think that's also very similar to what we just heard. Um, not everyone, in even in modern democracies nowadays, has this one vote, as we maybe will see in the United States pretty soon. And uh, we, of course, want to make a true direct democracy. And I think what is maybe different a little bit between our approach and, and maybe uh, other approaches is that we think it's very important to find a good balance between direct and representative democracy. Because, um, yes, the people should be asked directly on important things. But on the other side, not everybody can answer the 1,000 questions that uh, have to be, where decisions have to be made of every day. If we go through the different steps that GLOCO wants to achieve, and I'll keep it short where we, um, for example, the first point, of course, you can only give a vote to every global citizen if you have a unique, safe, and accessible digital identity. And I'm not going to talk about that much more because we heard a very nice explanation already from Santi. And I think that's also why joining forces makes a lot of sense because there are experts that know more on certain topics. Uh, once you know that everybody has a vote, then of course we have to work on figuring out what we should vote on. And we from the global community, we think that it should be mainly the problems that have um, are global issues that we should vote on globally and uh, how do you figure those how do you find those global topics is by having a platform where everybody can enter their problems uh, and or their concerns that they have and then of course this platform needs a lot of intelligence most likely will be an artificial 
um, has to be a transparent artificial network that then condenses these topics to find out what are really global topics because as i said we believe that only the global topics should be decided on by the global democracy platform the rest should be played back because we believe that there i mean on a family level on a local level also on a national level there are the, the uh there are the institutions that can solve the problems today of course i agree with us of that this is not ideal in many countries but we want to start uh, on the first hand with solving the global problems. And of course, if we have a good platform, then it, this platform, of course, can become maybe a model for other countries or even uh, replace um, institutions in non-democratic nations. But we think that we have to start and should take responsibility at the moment only for global problems. Then once you know the problems, then of course you have to work on the solutions. And again, even in, also in the solution finding, every citizen should have a vote. You could imagine that there's something like a, a big digital global citizens assembly where the ideas that people have to solve an issue can be brought together, where there's also voting on, on the different ideas on how you solve the global problems. Um, and so that you bring these um, solutions forward and once you have solutions, then uh, of course you want to create a ballot where the different ideas are on this ballot. And uh, then a global debate is gonna be important where the people discuss these different solutions. That's not something where we see a role of a global democratic system because there's a lot that will take care of that, uh, whether that's just the conventional media, the social media, uh, and that's going to be an important part that these things will be discussed before they then get to a vote and the vote and that's very important should be a modern vote so um, we also heard from Santiago that there are different new ways on how you can do a vote because in most countries even in Switzerland you normally can only vote yes or no to one specific question but we know that maybe it would make sense to, in, in some discussions, have analog votes, like that you could say um, that how much money, for example, you want to spend for something, whether you want to spend 1,000, 10,000 or a million, um, that you could also have um, maybe multiple choices in a certain question. And what we think is also very important is that you should maybe have the possibility for liquid democracy, because we heard from Santi, some people are tired of voting. Not everybody votes to, wants to vote on everything. Not everybody thinks he's an expert on anything. So the possibility to be able to give your vote to a person of trust, um, we think is also one possibility, one modern possibility of performing direct democracy that should be included into the system. Then last but not least, of course, you need a global impact. And as we are not the government, and I think we heard that a little bit also from, from Asaf, uh, it's gonna be mainly uh, the, the social pressure that we can apply if we have a huge system um, and, that we will, and that the people will control who implements the solutions in the way that they have been voted for by the global democracy and um, uh, in the end, it will be uh, the nations that have to implement the solutions. But I think a second aspect that is very important besides the social power of, of let's say, 5 billion people voting for a certain thing is also, and that's, uh, again, I think a crucial point, today, when we try to solve, let's say, an, uh, the, the global climate problem, then every nation has to find a solution which doesn't, um, which doesn't conflict with the nation's interest. And I think that we will have a solution finding on a global level, which will not, hopefully not have that problem, will be also a big advantage that there will be global solutions that will be proposed and uh, that do not stop at the national borders and should therefore also not uh, create a conflict for the different countries. I think those are the different points that we want to implement with GLOCO. 
And uh, I'm very glad to hear that there's a lot of uh, um, similar ideas and I think there are a lot of synergies between the different approaches. And I guess uh, that's also why we are meeting up today here, but I hand over to Lucy for the next question. Thank you very much. So that was a very nice overview, I think, showing, you know, uh, bringing together some of the issues, you know, how to collect issues, which we also heard from Asaf right over, you know, identity issues, right, thinking it right through to the transmission mechanisms um, and impact on a global level, actually solving the problems um, that we identified in the first round. Um, I would, um, we will have a discussion later, but actually at this point, I would like to dwell a little bit about on your initiatives um, and start thinking more concretely about how we can put our heads together and work together. And what I'd like to hear from you, um, based on the experiences that you've had so far, I think these, these three initiatives are in different um, degrees of development. Some are pretty much at the beginning. Others um, like Democracy Earth and Santiago Siri's um, engagement, um, you know, you've already been working in many different contexts with many different methods as well. Um, I would like to hear from you where you see the most urgency and um, the most potential for collaboration based on the experiences that you've done with your initiative. So every initiative brings its own strengths with it, its own unique selling propositions, its own unique features. Um, and you know, how can we combine forces um, to propel democracy um, into reality? But not just on an abstract level. What I would like to know is, um, much like Santiago identified some of the urgent issues at hand, um, but where can we collaborate? Where can we join forces um, to start building a global democratic architecture um, which builds on synergies and, and complements, you know, full well understanding the challenges that we, that we face here? Um, so, um, Asaf, if I may start with you um, and from the perspective of the global online democracy, where would you see very specific entry points where you bring something to the table, but you also feel that, uh, you know, you could um, propel your initiative forward if you collaborate uh, with others based on what you heard from GLOCO and also uh, from Democracy Earth? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I was really thinking a lot about this, uh, this um, collaboration aspect of the Global Online Democracy Organization. Um, there, so we, we have a lot of organizations around the world working on, on reaching a direct uh, global democracy. Uh, even more, it's people that, are, that want to partake participate in these organizations and, and we need to find ways how to, to unite these organizations and people together. I think that exactly what you just said that we need to like join everyone around some kind of one platform, one global um, platform that will help us make better decisions and find ways to, to collaborate. Um, but how to collaborate, like what actions uh, should we take? And I really think that it's it's not up to us, leaders of, of direct uh, uh, democracy organization, to decide for everyone else. It's quite a, a strange situation because we are leading these organizations, but uh, at the same time we are talking about direct democracy. So so if so, it should be a bottom up approach. We cannot decide for everyone else what to do. Um, so in other words, my opinion is that we should create one decision-making system for all organizations which help us make better decisions democratically. And I think um, we speak a lot about um, poli politics and democracy. Um, why, why to go in, into these terms? Why not to, to speak about... Um, decision-making system. We need a decision-making system to help us organize all the levels in our lives, 
me and my wife, me and uh, uh, me and my uh, uh, the the parents in the in the in the class of of my son that wants to agree on certain rules with with using phones, for example, this is a critical issue now in <laughs> in our house, and 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 then in the neighborhood, in the city, uh, um, of course, uh, nationally, and and from that will grow the global level. Um, why do we look at it in a pol political way? I think, I think in that sense, um, we need to a little bit shape, shape our, our, the way we look at it. Um, so, as I said, there is a lot of people around the world that want to participate, uh, but there are also organizations, Lucy, you mentioned it just now, that are working on different issues such, such as global warming, hunger, wars, animal rights, and, and the list is endless. All these organizations have a direct interest uh, to support new functioning decision-making systems. They can unite their followers um, around one decision-making platform and expose their issue to much greater population and then vote on how to solve the problem. So I think we need to communicate this message together um, that we can and, and, and unite the message and the values and better communicate it to the world. Um, what else? So also, I think about representative democracy a lot, and I think that, that we cannot really play chess on a monopoly, mon monopoly board. Uh, we need to play the rules of representative democracy and start it introducing our own representatives into the government. These representatives will represent direct democracy organizations, and as I said before, will not have any decision-making power. And this is something we can, we can just, we can start now. We can start collecting uh, supporters around the world with the right message. And, uh, and I, have, I had a lot of success in it. People are really, when you talk with them about direct democracy, and uh, they, they understand, they understand that, that representative democracy is not working for us anymore. Um, about the, the weaknesses and, uh, and uh, strength of, of the organization, the Global Online Democracy is a, is a new organization, uh, and, and we are quite short on resources at the moment. Uh, we need more developers to develop the, the decision-making system. Uh, that we already have it fun functioning in, in Israel as a prototype. Uh, for example, there is a group called the Citizens uh, Writing uh, Constitution, uh, which is using our system. And they are doing it, of course, to introduce new uh, constitution to Israel. Israel doesn't have a constitution. Uh, our strengths are that we have a highly professional team. I think our message is, is powerful and, and clear. And our model provide, uh, uh, provides uh, practical steps to change from representative democracy to direct democracy with the least damage possible. Uh, and also it gives the power to the people to criticize and change the model democratically if something doesn't work. So we all win. Uh, we build this organization for the people, so nothing is ours. Nothing is mine. Uh, in fact, our model is open for all people to use, share, get ideas, whatever they choose to do with it. And um, so it's yours. And uh, we all have a collective ownership uh, in it. So of course, we, we welcome and happy to participate in uh, all collaborations. And I hope this collaboration will be the first to, to, to go forward. Thank you very much, Asaf. So what I take from that actually is that you put emphasis on the systems, on the procedures. Um, you put emphasis on, on kind of a grassroots involvement. Um, and also an interesting take, I think, on the relationship between representation and direct democracy as well. I think that's something that uh, many platforms and initiatives actually grapple with. Um, but let's move to Santiago, because you probably have the most uh, experience also with voting systems. Um, and yes, let me hand over to you, please. Thank you. 
Um, so a lot of thoughts. Um, I come from a lot of frustration because I've tried a lot of these ideas in the past decade or so. Uh, so that has turned me into a pessimist more than an optimist about this problem. Um, I can tell you a lot of about the potential failures, each of the ideas that sound interesting at the beginning, how they can turn very ugly at the end. For instance, for example, the idea of liquid democracy, which is really interesting. You, know, you vote directly on issues and you delegate your vote to those uh, that have uh, you want to delegate power to. Uh, and we have seen in the blockchain world a lot of experiments around liquid democracy. Uh, there's a, there was a network uh, born in Berlin called LISC that did a, a consensus mechanism system. The technical name is delegated proof of stake. But you know it's a, it's a version of liquid democracy. And the, the consequence from a game theoretic point of view of that uh, of that uh, game because it's actually a game democracy um, was that uh, it led to super delegates and eventually led to two very big delegates. Uh, their own version of Republicans and Democrats. Um, if uh, there's also the case of the Pirate Party, uh, which had uh, all of the delegations in their system uh, allocated to the guy that was responsible for translating proposals to a neutral language, and he we had like 60% or 70% of the power in the system, uh, de facto becoming a dictator in, in a system of liquid democracy. So the game theory. Of, of, of what works and what doesn't work and how we can improve the first past the post voting, which is also a very problematic game, uh, which leads to the tyranny of the majority uh, and leads to you know, populist outcomes and a lot of frustration from minorities in many societies around the world. Um, we, the game theory you know, needs, needs, needs to experiment a lot. Uh, one of the most interesting ideas uh, that we have uh, researched is quadratic voting. To explain it briefly, it's an idea around um, you. everyone gets the same amount of votes, but the more votes you use on a given issue, the cost of allocating those votes increases uh, quadratically. So if I put one vote on an issue, it will cost me one vote. If I put two votes in an issue, it will cost me four votes. Uh, and, and, and if I put three votes, it will cost me nine votes. The cost increases quadratically. And this means that as a voter, either I will put a few, few votes on a lot of issues or most of my voting power in the one issue I really deeply care about. Uh, we have implemented this in the state of Colorado for the Colorado House, the Congress in the United States. And interestingly, in the year prior, they have tried participatory budgeting. Uh, this is the legislators, the Colorado legislators. Uh, with participatory budgeting, they found that they had to decide over 100 bills and how they would prioritize these 100 bills that they would introduce to the House. With participatory budgeting, it ended with an outcome that 60 to 70% of the bills had the same amount of votes. So they were able to probably prioritize the top 10, but then it was a long tail of bills that it was very confusing which one was more relevant than the other. With quadratic voting, uh, no more than three or four bills had the same amount of votes. Uh, so it led to a very organic distribution of the preferences of the participants. And if they were able to prioritize a long, a long tail, a long list of 108 bills that were competing uh, for a budget of $180 million in the Colorado House. So now the problem with quadratic voting is that uh, it, it requires very good user experience, very good user interfaces, because it's not a simple idea to explain to the average voter. And a system is as democratic as, as it's easy to explain to the average voter. Otherwise, you're excluding voters from the process. Uh, so you have this trade-off between usability and the quality of the collective decision-making mechanism. Um, my recommendation for collaboration, there's, uh, is, I, I, I press on this, is, is to pay attention to Ethereum. Ethereum is the most relevant protocol that has emerged out of the internet since Bitcoin, and Bitcoin probably since the World Wide Web. Uh, and the thing with Ethereum is that it allows for innovation in smart contracts. And smart contracts means that the systems created there uh, effectively move capital. They effectively 
they can lend capital, they can borrow capital, they, they can uh, um, do all kinds of uh, things with, with, with capital. And in, uh, right now, it's, there's literally almost $10 billion uh, exposed in different smart contracts in the financial ecosystem of Ethereum. A lot of these smart contracts are trying to uh, give ownership to the users, to the community using these systems. Uh, they do it by distributing tokens and the community is, is making collective decisions that have impact in the development of these protocols and also in how these protocols deal with capital. Um, I think that if we have to think about uh, the, the, a global democracy, we need to think about the nation state. The nation state is effectively a consequence of an information technology, primarily about is a consequence of the printing press and how the printing press led to imagine communities across Europe and around the world that eventually uh, people started reading books printed in Spanish or in Italian or French or English instead of reading the sacred scriptures written in Latin by a priest. And that leap from the sacred scriptures in Latin and the language of power to uh, the vernacular languages, the languages of the people, led to the, a new configuration that uh, took form and shape with the emergence of the nation state through different political processes and wars that happened throughout the last 300 years. Uh, now we are all being, uh, uh, and especially this year, which was pretty much a quantum leap, we're being subjected to a new kind of information technology, and that's digital technology, digital information that moves at the speed of light, and that uh, it, it fundamentally uh, has a limit that it's the mathematical capabilities of these machines that intermediate our relationships. And uh, these mathematical capabilities, the discipline that looks at the limits of the mathematical capabilities of information technology, such as computers, is cryptography. Cryptography, uh, there's, a, a, there's a very interesting book from the late uh, 90s called The Sovereign Individual that argues that if we live in a world where transactions happen in cyberspace uh, and are completely encrypted, then there's no nation state that can interfere with that. And this will lead to a revolution in this notion of sovereignty, uh, eventually leading to, to a kind of personal sovereignty in contrast to the national sovereignty that has been governing the world for all the last uh, 300 years. And this is an argument because of how secrets operate in the world of cryptography. Secrets are ultimate, ulti ultimately uh, something that is controlled by an individual. Uh, physical persons are much better at managing secrets than uh, uh, non-physical persons or uh, institutions or entities. Uh, Sorry, can I just um, ask you, just because I'm looking at the time um, and would also like Gay to have an opportunity to speak. Um, maybe if you can just wrap up uh, your input and, and, and identify, we've been talking about digital um, technologies, which I think are key from what I understand from your input, um, to be working around those and to be developing those as well. Um, if you wanted to just give us one more statement on where you see that we can collaborate or where you think is the most urgent step in collaborating, just one or two sentences before we move on and open up the discussion. Well, very clearly, we need to look at the latest developments in cryptography, which is the way you build systems that have trust. Cryptography is about coding trust. And this happens in the surface of open source software uh, and clearly on, on the development of smart contracts and what's happening on Ethereum. If we're gonna have a democracy that it's deployable over the internet, it's gonna be in a network like this. It's not gonna happen elsewhere. Thank you very much, Santiago. Very, very interesting and very specific, actually, based on your experiences. Gary, would you like to take the floor? Yeah, so I think, again, uh, coming last, I don't have to repeat everything. Um, global democracy has to be done together. That's absolutely clear. And I agree with Asaf, of course. I mean, in the end, it's going to be the people who decide which platform will win. But uh, we now have to build 
this platform, maybe different platforms so that people can then choose which, which one is the one that uh, they, they like the most. Um, our way might still be long. Uh, so Santi sounded a little bit pessimistic. Uh, and I agree that the way might still be long and we still have a lot to do, but I think nothing is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. And I think the time has definitely come. And I think together we can really achieve this. And that's why I think it's so important that we all work together. I mean, we heard uh, already a lot of ideas and a lot of pilots that Santi has done. And uh, we heard from a lot of ideas that, that Asaf has presented. And I think this is gonna be the strength that there's more and more initiatives working in this direction and that we can exchange. Because yes, there will be a lot of pilots still uh, necessary, a lot of know-how has still to be gained, but that more and more people work on this, I think that is what gives me, um, um, what reassures me that this system is, is gonna come. And I mean, the question was, where can we really work together and profit? And I think we heard already some examples, a unique, safe and accessible digital identity. Um, this has to be created, but I'm sure that it will come. And not every one of these initiatives should work on their own approach, but we should see who has the best approach and then use that one very similar to other things like the global voting platform. What are the best methods? How can we do it best? Um, and, and, and Santi talked about that, but also global impact in the end. Um, there will be different approaches on how the global impact can be achieved once we have good decisions uh, and Global Online Democracy has ideas that go in that direction, but we also heard uh, a lot this, during this week about Simpol. Uh, Simpol might also be a very nice uh, opportunity on how uh, policies that have been decided on such a platform can then be implemented into uh, global democracy or, or sorry, into, into the national um, uh, governments and national rules. And I think that is what gives me um, reassures me that it's going to happen because there's more and more initiatives working into very similar ways. And I think that's also why it's very important that we work together. Uh, that's why we from GLOCO initiated this idea about a global democracy initiative. Um, hopefully we are going to sign this during the global forum on modern direct democracy, uh, which takes place in April, May next year, uh, where we want to bring together as many institutions working towards a global democracy as possible. Democracy Earth uh, already um, uh, agreed to join in global online democracy, also Democracia Global, uh, Glode and Gloco. So we already have five people in. And I think if we collect more, there will be a lot of potential with a lot of synergies to accelerate the path forward towards a global democracy. Um, and just to add one more thing, I mean, I talked a lot about all these knowledges and all these different software parts that we can profit from, the concepts that we can profit from, but we should also not underestimate that if we work together, uh, we might also be more powerful in increasing the awareness about the importance of a global democracy um, if we join forces. Um, we do not want to compromise the different specific goals of all these societies, but on all the synergistic parts, which there are a lot, uh, as we just learned in this in this one hour, uh, we should really join forces and then I'm sure we can accelerate uh, the way forward and, and hopefully make Santi a little bit less uh, pessimistic. On this optimistic note, uh, I am counting on 5 billion voters raising their voice, using these different technologies in a safe way without being um, undermined by Chinese or other Swiss bots, who knows. Um, I think I would, um, I think it's given us a very good overview, right from, you know, que questions of, of identity, which are key digital identity, um, to ways thinking about how individuals can start participating in more effective ways, in safer ways, in solution oriented ways with regard to global problems, you know. Um, so we have this uh, free rider pro problem, which we need to break through as well. 
Um, and we're, we need to think about ways of mobilizing people. Um, and we need to, you know, we really need to think about ways how we can roast the feet of, of those in power and how we can hold them um, to account. And I think it's a very exciting set of initiatives which we've um, now been um, uh, party to. And I think it does bode a little better, a little more optimistic for, for, the, for the future. Um, I would like to actually now hand over to Caroline. I think you will be moderating part of the discussion at least, but uh, definitely open up to um, questions and input from the side um, of our audience as well. Yes, thank you, Lucy. Um, so a lot of people have been posting in the chat already, and I just want to um, reiterate. Um, so you're very welcome to post questions in there, or you can raise your hand um, electronically. Sergio has already has his hand raised. Uh, you will be up soon, but there was one person who had a question before you. Um, and just for the people who are watching on YouTube, know that we are also monitoring questions in the chat there. Um, so uh, we will take those into the panel. Um, so some people have posted um, some examples of uh, different digital platforms in here. Uh, Rasmus, and Rasmus has al already left, um, but he is inviting people to join him tomorrow at 2 um, at our global forum uh, for a conference on the Democracy Without, Border, uh, Democracy Without Borders voting platform. So I just wanted to um, read that for the people who are watching this. Um, Arnold has also shared something. I don't know if you want to shortly say something about um, what you've posted in the chat, Arnold. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I was wondering why Vote at All, uh, the platform that I built, is more oriented towards argumentation. It asks for input by scientists and other experts to analyze the problems before we are thinking about solving them. So the questions are, uh, <clears throat> what's the goal behind uh, to which the problem stands in the way? Uh, so one silly example, and then I'll stop. If we are thinking about uh, melting glass from a uh, glass we throw away every day, you could uh, consider the energy and put solar panels on top, on the roof of the, melting installation, but of course that would be silly, but most people jump towards such superficial solutions. So that is why I built this uh, platform to go to the root cause. So that's something to consider. And if anyone wants to test them, nobody wanted up till now, then you can contact me on this uh, site. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for uh, also reminding us that deliberation uh, is an important part of democracy. Um, then there is a question from Andreas. Uh, do you just want to go ahead and ask it live? Yes, of course I can do that. Um, do you hear me? Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm. First of all, I'm a real fan of the of of course of digital tools, and I think they can really be a big. Help. I mean, there are a lot of chances, uh, but as we heard, of course, also a lot of challenges, how to do that. What I wanted just to bring in is that we also have, I mean, also at Democracy National, we are working on the World Citizen Initiative proposal. And I think one thing we always have to consider is that, of course, not everybody in the world has internet. So we are, from our perspective here in Europe, it's really easy to, to be part of the world, to be in the internet. But as I, I just checked it on the, on the statistics here, that it's only 55% or maybe we can also say positive, already 55% have the internet access in the world. But of course, the other half of the world is, has big problems to have regular internet um, possibilities. Um, and this, of course, is differs significantly in the, in the regions. So in Africa, the rate is below 30% in, in most of the regions. Also in Asia, there are region, regions where there's really um, only uh, one quarter of the population has internet. So my question is just, how do we deal with that? Uh, maybe you have an idea about that um, to solve global issues, because of course they also have to be, or have to have a say in, in this, um, or in finding solutions, right? Not only the people who have access to internet. And I'm not sure, Karen, should I also ask the next question I had too? Or should I wait? No, uh, please go ahead. We take them together. Yeah, and then... a, yeah. maybe just a short, um, 
or really small question. I understood Asaf that he wants to address with his um, technology, especially national politicians, national institutions. And I was just not sure if Gloco had already a proposal and maybe I missed it. Um, who should be the addressee of this such uh, global democracy platforms? Uh, like, is it for example, the United Nations or do we have another proposal or is it still open and we have to find it an addressee for, for our platforms? Thank you. Um, I don't know who wants to go first there. Thank you very much, Andreas, for your two very good questions. Uh, I think the one with internet access is important. Also, when we talk about mobilization of voters and not least the liberation, which would also be online, at least partly. Um, uh, so, Asaf, you were raising your hand. Did you want to? Yes, yes, I can, I, I can actually answer both of the questions like uh, there ways how to how to bring more particip uh, participation um, in in uh, you know places without without internet we just need to be uh, a little bit creative if uh, if we if we in our it's included in our model so you can go there and, and see the the full plan in in our site um, we speak about bringing um, internet internet centers to places without internet and we can give some kind of encouragement on voting. So in very poor places in the world, um, we, can, we can make these, these places where, where people, where these centers where people are, are going into a, um, a computer and vote and then they get something for it. They get, they get three euros, five euros, depends on the resources, but, um, but then, Participation can be can can be bigger than to balance the world. It's a very tough task, but we must have a system that is all geographic levels. We must involve all uh, participants or all all the citizens in the um, in the decision making process. If we if we exclude some, it will not be democratic. Um, so I think. I think we we can do it only if we have all levels system. Then we can get all the people really to to participate. Um, about the global level, um, we we are not um, um, want to uh, you know collaborate. Sorry, lost words. But I collaborate with the with with the UN. I think the UN had uh, enough time to to show us that he can you know take the the lead and and be um, an institution that that leads something for the people. We want the the change to come from the grassroots. We want a system. Uh, um, our colleague here from 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 Democracy Earth. Uh, said that uh, that there is a lot of problems with 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 technology. Uh, we understand, but we don't need to 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 uh, present it to to the user. The user need to see a page that looks a bit like Facebook, uh, with different uh, uh, geographical levels. Uh, he go he go in. He see the problems that are relevant for him. Uh, how will we know what the the relevant problems for him? We will know it with the with the AI. That will with organize things. Of course, he can he can make it wider. He can make it a, a, a bit more narrow. Uh, but but eventually he is he is watching the problems on his street, his city, his country, and global level will will be created once we have representatives in the governments that are from uh, the direct democracy organization. Okay, so now you, the, sorry, I still have to interrupt you there, because, but I'd make, like to make sure that we have enough time for the questions. I think a big issue here is mobilization, and I think technology is key. I think you're right, you know, I think we need to be aware that technology is not everything, but already, of course, a huge leap into the future. Um, mobilization and participation is key, Asaf, you mentioned that. Um, the question is how we do that. I think there was a specific question to the global level 
um, uh, to Bloco, in fact, to Gary, about how to involve the UN. Asaf says that the UN is one institution amongst others, uh, but not relevant for the implementation of the global online democracy as such. Gary, do you have um, anything you wanted to say about um, how Bloco goes about addressing the global level, which in distinction to, to the global online democracy, does not want to address local or national issues. Gloco only wants to address global issues. Well, that's our hypothesis is because, I mean, I like the idea of us of that um, everybody could vote on everything, but we just believe that it's not possible because there's millions of things that you would then have to decide. And that's why we should have a balance a balance between direct democracy, where direct democracy is really needed, so you can really solve the problems, and also uh, where the global perspective is important. Again, climate change at the moment cannot be solved because everybody has to think on a national level. Nobody can think on a global level. Even uh, there are different votes that even we have in Switzerland right now, where in the end, our uh, the, na the nation is normally in the way of solving the global problem. And I think that is where we want to vote on a global level, but then it, the national institutions and also the EU and also the UN, they should be the right um, powers that are already there, that are um, existing, and that should then implement uh, the politics. Now, of course, the question is, how can you force them? And that's uh, where we still have to work out a little bit, but in the end, don't forget, that the social pressure, the people want to be re-elected and also having a solution that covers a global perspective and not only a national perspective, those are, we think, very important keys to hopefully get there. I don't know whether that answers the question of Andreas. Does it answer your question? No, no, thank you, first of all, for the, for, um, for, for the answers. I mean, um, I still have then, of course, the question if we are trying to convey or to speak then with the EU or with the national national governments, then why not using their tools? I understand the idea of having like a international global um, pressure. And but then, of course, the question is, is it not, is it then, what is the difference then to, to platforms like, I'm a little bit challenging you now, of course, to Avas, right? Or, such petitioning platform, which have sometimes millions of, of signatures for a specific topic, and then um, uh, sending that to to national gov uh, parliament yeah, very, governments. Very so just a, just a, as a as a remark, um, um, but of course uh, I know it's it's uh, the question is really then how to hold them accountable, right? Yeah, absolutely. Very good points. Very good points, really. So let me try to answer number one your question about these. Um, uh, petition platforms and which and we love those and we think they should also be included in our approach to bring all the forces together that the, the small but very very important thing that they're lacking at the moment uh, is actually just the no button at the moment you can always support an initiative of, of us but nobody can say no to any of those petitions and and you might think this is a detail but this is the detail because how much does it help if you know that 1 million is supporting something if you don't know where the 2 million are actually opposing? No, so it's that's a totally right. I agree. That's so, a very so, important difference then, yeah. And, and, and that's um, why, uh, again, we contacted some of these platforms already. We tried to bring them also into our initiative. They have a lot of knowledge. They know how to mobilize people. They have a lot of followers. So I think they should part, be part of the movement. So to answer your question, uh, um, existing initiatives should be included. We are not trying to do any competition. What we are trying to do is to bring all these powers together uh, because together we're stronger, right? So, um, and also the tools that there are existing. I mean, it's very nice that there is a European um, initiative and a parliament assembly and, and all these kind of things. But at the moment, it still, doesn't help you to solve the global problems if you only have Europe on your side. And uh, if there would be a U UNPA, United Nations Parliament Assembly, I mean, that could also be a very nice approach. I just don't believe that it's ever gonna happen because the United Nations is run 
at the moment by these big uh, nations and by these representatives that have been there for many, many years. And that's why we think that, um, yes, existing tools should be used wherever they can be used. And, and there's a lot of um, uh, help that they can provide, but there is a missing piece, which we think has to be added, which is this global democracy. Thank you very much for that very lively discussion. Um, I just uh, want to remind everybody to try and keep it short so that we can get to some of the questions uh, that are being posted in the chat. Um, Sergio, I'm going to give you um, the mic in just a second. I just want to read some things from the chat because I think we won't get to it otherwise. Um, so Christoph writes that um, if we would make the EU like Switzerland, uh, 27 countries, 26 cantons, it's not so different in the end. With referenda in every country, then we would have real European citizen lobby. I think that's an interesting thought. Um, and then Geza, um, who was also in the last session, um, is writing that um, direct democracy uh, with the digital divide at a global level is, of course, difficult, but a citizens assembly um, could be a very nice way to overcome that. So these are maybe some um, some things that you can take into the discussion if you can. But now then, Sergio, I will give you the floor to ask your question. Please go ahead. Um, hello. Th thank you very much for giving me the floor. Actually, it won't completely be a question. It's a set of observations. One is that um, we're talking about global democracy. I think the first thing is to get uh, democracy beyond the boundaries of the nation state. Because so far, democracy exists within nation states, and the challenge is to go beyond that. And actually, there's one institution worldwide in which it is started, namely the European Union. And in that sense, making European, the democracy at European level, European Union level, is a sort of pilot of, I would say, more global democracy with the advantage that the institutions already exist and that, that it goes beyond just social pressure. It is actual. Uh, this is actual power, decision-making powers that the European Union has. In that sense, being able to set up uh, an EU-wide um, organization which is democratic is essential. And uh, for that, there is uh, the tool which is the European Cooperative Society. This is what I'm actually building right now with uh, an initiative called Cosmopolitical Cooperative. I've let, let the, uh, the, um, uh, we the website on the chat. And here, um, I mean, it, it, it's based also on a software called Kuneagi with a set of features may, uh, of deliberation that is uh, in order to achieve um, openness in the amendment, there are uh, uh, working groups to amend a proposal. It's not only uh, take it or leave it. A uh, second point is uh, that it, uh, it, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being disturbed by my little daughter, she's three years old, I'm sorry. It's, uh, this just uh, happens with online <laughs> conferences, oh, don't worry. Sorry about that. Um, uh, second point uh, is that you need, you need to, um, so there, there's, there are tools also for the openness in, in terms of initiative and selection using um, uh, support tokens and so-called majority judgment to separate uh, between uh, solutions given to a given issue. And I'm very um, well aware of what Santiago is saying about hostility that uh, democrat democratic uh, procedures are uh, um, attract. And for this, the I mean, not so technological solutions that we are looking for are immutable pseudonyms on the one hand, immutable re reputation, and a distributed human, human verification of identity with, uh, with distributed access to the, uh, to, to the, um, uh, to, to the uh, underlying database. So all this brings a, a sort of a system which has the capacity to, I would say, experiment at EU level, and I insist European Union level, based on that specific institution, transnational democracy, which is, in, in my views, uh, one of the first steps towards um, more global democracy because it it it, it break, breaks the first boundary which is that of the nation states thank you very much um, was there was there something you wanted to know from the panelists or a question you had a uh, specific question um, 
Well, uh, again, um, with about uh, making building bridges here, um, the point I would have is I would say very much about what Sang Jiangu was, was saying. You said that you have experimented a lot of um, technological tools. Do, would you have a sort of summary somewhere of the conclusions that you have taken of your many experiences, many years of experience in, in, in trying all these uh, topics, some of which seem attractive in the first place, but once you test them, you realize that there are problems. Have you made any analysis of this uh, beyond this very interesting solution that you propose on a distributed um, uh, um, uh, a DAO, uh, I, don't know, I don't remember what it stands for, uh, distributed something organization, sorry. Thank you. I think I saw Asaf not. Uh, also Santiago, um, and I would just, uh, because we really do only have five minutes left on this panel, um, I would like you to maybe also, if you have any concluding remarks that you would like to make, uh, this, this would also be the chance, I think, for that. So um, on my end, uh, I'm attaching here on the chat a presentation. It's, it's not a recap of every single pilot we have done in the past. But it's an overview, it's a recent presentation I've done at the university. Um, uh, I don't know, it covers some of the basics of stuff that we have researched and we have looked into. Uh, in particular, I would encourage to check the paper we have done on proof of personhood. Uh, the bottom line is that if we want to have democratic systems, we need to understand how to do identity and identity in a way that is privacy preserving and uh, and that remains a pretty a pretty open problem with that with that kind of breakthrough uh, every decision making mechanism social system uh, that we can think of is implementable we need to it's, it's kind of like thinking how we can do facebook without a single point of failure which is the facebook corporation in a decentralized way and in a way where the signaling of the identities do not require disclosing personal information. And in a way that we are sure, certain that no identity controls more than one node in the network. Uh, it's a very difficult problem, but once that's solved, democracy is, is, is the killer app. Yeah, Caroline, you asked for a concluding, conclusion. Um... I think my conclusion after this very interesting panel is that uh, there are a lot of people thinking in very similar directions. There has a lot of experience uh, been gained already on many, many different levels, uh, whether that's uh, through existing um, uh, institutions like the EU or whether it's completely uh, standalone uh, technology things that we heard from Santiago. And I think this just um, shows that the bringing together of all these ideas and of these initiatives and also create more of the exchange like we had it right now is going to be very important. So I'm very, very positive and I think we just now have to find a good form of, of, of consolidating all this knowledge that is there and bringing it all together so that it will happen fast. Yeah, so I really, I, I think uh, very much like Gary, I'm, uh, uh, I'm positive about, about this change. I'm positive about working together and get all our wisdom and, and, and bring the wisdom of the pe people for, for um, um, good decision making. Um, for me, this, this conversation was more, a, a lot about technology, uh, decision making, uh, donations and how to get a lot of organiz organizations uh, together in order to, to, to uh, you know, get the, get the, um, uh, the result, the, the answer of what we need in order to, to, to get it forward. And uh, definitely we need a strong message, strong message that will, will swap a lot of people um, um, behind and, and will show the people that they have, there, there is a solution, uh, they ha there is a, a way out from these uh, um, places. Uh, of course, we are in Europe, so here is uh, but much better uh, decision-making uh, um, um, 
system, so it's a, it's a scale always. I think I, I live in Finland, so it's somewhere on top. Finland is, is amazing in how they, they're doing in their, their decision making, but I lived in other countries and I saw that in these countries, decision making is, is, is really poor. And uh, I do think we need to give the power to the people. Uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, I think that's the bottom line. Thank you. Uh, Asav, I think that is a great um, way to end this panel, power to the people, um, on all levels, politicizing them, mobilizing them, reaching out, sharing information, sharing strengths, sharing engagement. Um, and I would like to thank all three of you for joining us on the panel, for sharing your experiences, your thoughts, your knowledge, and your vision, not least. Um, and I look forward to continuing this conversation, hopefully with many of you who have been listening in and, and, and engaging in the discussion as well. Um, and yes, I hope to meet you all in person in April when we will be signing the Global um, Democracy Initiative to push global democracy to the next level. So thank you very much. And I'll hand back to Caroline with that. Yes, I would like to thank all four of you for being here tonight, for organizing this wonderful panel. Um, that is obviously a topic that um, that a lot of people are very interested in. Interesting in the chat was very lively uh, during this panel, um, and I hope that we can continue this discussion uh, next year in April at the Global Forum in Bern. Um, to all of you uh, participants, panelists, uh, I'd just like to say don't leave if you, I mean, you can if you want to, but uh, if you stick around, we have another very interesting panel um, coming up, or a lecture rather, um, on how civil society and citizen participation um, can help overcome economic dis disadvantages and the current crisis in Mexico. Um, so something completely different and yet very similar. So thank you very much and have a nice evening, have a nice morning. Nice afternoon, wherever you are. <laughs>